The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. This is Michael Patrick Hicks, and with me is our co-host, Matt Killjoy Brandenburg. <laughs> we finally did it. <laughs> no Rich today. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately, over the weekend we lost Rich. <laughs> but he will be back next week. Yep, he's he's lost in the woods right now. And since he is not here, oh, that was good. I just, yeah, yeah. You did, I just got what you did there. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> I did. Since Richard is not here, we are going to be discussing his fiction debut. Yeah. With the short story Beyond the Triangle, which you can read in the recently released anthology Dark Words, Stories of Urban Legends and Lore by Matthew Wildeson. Yes, is that, and I think this is the first of his Dandelion Publishing. I believe it is. Because I was trying to think, because I know he he self-published, I think, everything. Yeah, I don't know if Matt does that under the Dandelion imprint, or if this is the first, I'm not sure. Either way, it's pretty he might, cool. He might have it as an LLC, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I it, it yeah, who knows. But it's still, it's neat that he's got something out there. It um, is. For both. Both yeah. of them, yeah. We're glad that Rich finally got his debut. He's been going at this for a little while. I Every time I turn around, he's writing something new. So it's awesome that he finally got something published. And since he's not here, we're going to tear it apart today. Yes. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that this morning. Well, I was like, you know, are people going to think this is, I don't know, hubris? Because I don't think we've, we've, we haven't done any of your stuff. Um, no, we haven't. I mean, we've talked about it because both Rich and I have read your stuff and we've discussed right. it, but we've never actually done a review like this. Um, and so I was like, oh, are people going to be like, oh, they're going to be so nice about it? Yeah, no, it is complete nepotism, 100 percent, because <laughs> we don't want to be kicked off the show yet. We are That's we're still right. ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is going to be all straight. We love it so much. Yes, <laughs> and you know what? I did actually just download this yesterday, so I've only had time to read Richard's story. There's a number of other ones in here that look very interesting, including works by Cassie Daly. Or is it Casey? Casey or Cassie? That I'm not it. sure what how she goes by. <laughs> I think it's Cassie. I feel is like it Cassie? I think so. And if it's not, we apologize. You'll have to come on and correct us. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, Patrick McDonough, who we've had on here before, so we know how to say his name. Yeah, that's true. Uh, comics writer Gavin Dillinger making his fiction debut also in this story as a prose writer. Yeah. So we've got yeah. some good stuff to go through here. Right. I, I'm looking forward to reading this whole thing properly one day. Me too. Um, but for now, we're just going to give Rich his due. Yeah, I, I picked it up when it came out, and I just happened to be in the middle of another anthology, so I was like, I'll get to this one. And I, I, th- I was wondering, I was like, should I read some other stuff before we talk? But then, I, you know, life happens. So. Yeah, and I am now on a sea horror kick, so <laughs> oh, nice. I, I'm trying to. I downloaded a whole bunch of shit that I had in my Kindle TBR, so I've got like, I just started reading this morning Hunter Shay's They Rise, yes, which is about. Um, I think they're called ghost fish or ghost sharks, <laughs> uh, but they're these living fossils of what were presumed extinct killer fish. Uh, and they have come back and are wreaking hell along the coastline of Florida. So are they not ghost sharks? Are they? They're not sharks. 
They're not sharks. No, they're just they're called ghost sharks, but they're not actually sharks. I'm not sure yet what they are. <laughs> I imagine that'll be coming up soon. But I loaded up Hunters They Rise. I got his Montauk Monster. Nice. Uh, James Moore's Deeper. I've been meaning to get to that one forever. Tim Wagner did a couple of Teeth of the yeah. Sea and Blood Island. I yes. got a couple out of print Kindle editions. I got Adam Caesar's Bottom Feeders and Gabino Iglesias's Hungry Darkness. <laughs> So I'm on a kick. I, this is my plan for the next few days here is to try and get through as many of these as I can, because they're all pretty short. They're novella length. Yeah. Uh, James Moore is deeper. That one might be a bit longer. I think that might actually be a novel, but yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm ready to go. It's summertime. I yeah. always get into this kind of mood where summer rolls around. For me, this is like Jaws season. Yes, 100%. I have been itching to rewatch Jaws. I looked up because now that we have Discovery Plus, when is Shark Week? <laughs> so that'll be coming you up. You have next Discovery month. Plus? Nice. Yeah, we do. When Discovery started, we got a deal through Verizon that we could get like six months free. So we're like, heck yeah. I mean, we love the Food Network. Like we watch yes. Chopped and Guy Fieri did like the Tournament of Champions. So we oh, yes. caught up on that. So like six months free of Food Network. Yeah. Yeah. I want that. (laughs) (laughs) I do have to say Tournament of Champions is pretty awesome. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, you know, it's funny because Guy Fieri is such like a goofball, um, but he does a lot of good stuff (laughs) like behind the scenes. and, And I think that's cool. He's not. Like he does, I feel like he promotes it a little, but he doesn't promote as much as he does. So, yeah, uh, I mean, this whole thing with COVID, he has really, really stepped up to the plate to try and raise money for restaurants in need, and he's been yeah. doing a fantastic job with that. So, yeah, I know uh, the New York Times when they had the chance to shit on his restaurant, they took it and yeah. ran every inch of it into the ground as deep as they could, but. I like Guy. I know he gets a lot of shit on the internet, but I think he's a fun <laughs> character. He is. And, you know, like, yeah, he's just as good. He knows who he is. He knows what he's doing. And he's just having fun with it. And yes. I think, you know, it's one of those things, too. And I know people are like Food Network talk, but hey, this could Hell yes, Food Network talk. <laughs> this could I didn't apply. even get into the Bourdain stuff that they've got on Discovery Plus, oh, because God. if I do that, I'm going to start crying if I do that. Seriously. Uh, oh God. But with him, you know, it's one of those things with Guy, not with not Anthony Bourdain, but he I think he was the first of the Food Network stars. So like he was just like some nobody that got in a show and now look at what he's done. And and I think it's it goes to I think that works for any creative if if we want to bring it back to horror writing and even talking about Rich's story, the fact that like. As long as you just keep, you know who you are and you keep doing your thing, you can be this famous guy that gets torn down by New York Times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what we all aspire, I think, is to get thrashed by the New York Times at some point in our heck, career. Heck yeah. <laughs> at least they and, noticed you at that point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if somehow this writing career takes off and leads us to driving around the country in a convertible eating at diners. I'm okay with that. That that's yeah. the goal. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> as long as I don't have to pimp Kid Rock's shit, I'm okay with going everywhere else. True. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is like he uh, w- t- 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 he's definitely like opened up the finding the weird place to eat. So like when we travel, we try it, it's that you always then after watching that, you're always like, what is that weird place in the strip mall? I'm going to eat there because it might be the coolest place ever. <laughs> <laughs> they got like the mile high burger. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I was just for some reason, when I walked down to the living room the other day, man versus food was on. You remember that show? Yeah. I, what I really remember about, well, both diner dive in and drives or diners, Whatever the fuck it's called. The Triple D. Triple D. And uh, 
man versus food. What I most remember about these things is the toll this lifestyle has taken on, yeah. on these guys' physiques. Like I had seen, I think uh, back when we had cable, I think it was on Travel Channel that they had that man versus food. Yeah. And they had like an early episode from like season one. And then like then they were airing a new episode from the current season. Yeah. And I was like, he started out as this little guy. And then <laughs> <laughs> he just, <laughs> it was a lot. was winning a lot as the show went on. Yeah, that was rough. <laughs> it, it was such like a weird thing to watch too, because you're just like, I want to watch this guy be as gluttonous as possible. <laughs> yeah. It's like, as if I don't get enough of this in my own life, I have to <laughs> watch it on TV. And you're always just waiting. You're like, man, he's just going to vomit everywhere. Right. <laughs> you stand by me all over. Break out the fried tarantula for him and oh, bow God. down. <laughs> That's horrifying and gross. Or was that a different guy? Uh, that was a different guy. That was okay. uh, Andrew Zimmer. Right. <laughs> People are going to be like, what? When Rich is gone, will you talk about what we want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, the abyss has a hungry maw. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're going to eat weird food or giant food, we're going to talk about it. Well, we can talk about some other weird things we can get into. What did we read this week that was weird? What did you uh-huh. get into? Oh, man. So I, I I have a couple things. I'll start with Broken Eye Books. They recently kickstarted and released two weird anthologies. Uh, one was cootie shots required and uh, <laughs> um, what was weather change with W H E T H E R or how you spell weather. That's not the weather, not <laughs> the atmospheric not weather. The atmosphere. Yeah. Like whether or not you should. Yes. That, that weather, that weather. I haven't started that one, but I'm almost done with cootie shots required. And this is an anthology focused on it's weird and it's focused uh, – kids are the main protagonists. So, um, you know, it's – it's uh, I don't have it in front of me. There's a ton of great stories in there. There is uh, this one – a couple of the stories kind of deal with the future and apocalypse and children and what they're doing and how they're surviving. The one I just read it was totally up like a Ligotti kind of alley where these two uh, sisters, they are in a perfume shop. And one of them is missing. And so the other one is eight has to go find her. And it's a back room that's full of perfume. And oh, it, it, and it gets just, you know, as you can imagine, it, it saying Ligotti, it gets kind of weird. And th- there's like a darkness in there. A perfume shop is the most <laughs> fucking perfect Ligottian <laughs> setting. You can imagine that right. is amazing. <laughs> oh, it, it was it's it was awesome. I finished it yesterday and I was just like, damn, this is really good. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it's I'm, and I'm trying to think of some other ones. There, the first one. Gosh, I wish I could remember the authors. I don't have it here in the back. But the first one is the seven steps to kill. Um, it's like the Oogies. Yeah, Oogie. Like Oogie Boogie, but just Oogie. And so (laughs) it's like this step by step guide on how to kill this, like, I don't know, it seemed like the blob or like an ooze that has been hiding in the woods and uh, behind the school. And so these kids are like collecting, uh, making Molotov cocktails. They're sharpening not like sticks and they're just (laughs) collecting all these things. And it just, it's really cool. So, you know, I haven't seen. I think it just came out a couple weeks ago, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping more people find it. It's a pretty cool, pretty cool that they Broken Eye Books did both of these, and they're both just so strange and weird. Yeah, I haven't heard of these. I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, I remember. I'm trying to remember if the Kickstarter was late last year, and and so I jumped on it. I think even I think it was Robert Wilson actually posted something, and so. After looking at that and knowing his tastes and things, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally kickstarting this. Very cool. That That's one of mine. I have other ones, but we'll let you go next. All right. Well, I got two also. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is possibly a bit controversial. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, toward the end of May, start of June, um, like I read this thing at the start of last week, which for us would have been the very beginning of June. So I'm thinking Lisa Quigley 
uh, tweeted at probably the end of May. And for me, this tweet kind of summarizes exactly why creatives should not be afraid of tweeting politics or social (laughs) issues out of fear of alienating readers, because I saw her tweet which says, when Christians stop pushing abusive and harmful theology, I will stop being critical of Christian culture in my writing. Until then, expect to find this in my work or don't read my books. (laughs) Nice. That tweet immediately put Hell's Bells right at the top of my TBR. Nice. And I started reading that at the beginning of last week. Like, I think literally the next morning after that tweet, I started in on Hell's Bells, and (laughs) it is fantastic horror. It's wonderfully critical of Christianity and the kind of proselytizing douche canoes that are very righteous, but also extraordinarily hypocritical. (laughs) And what this revolves, it is part of unnerving's rewind or die series and it came out in last year may 2020 so brief recap about it is it's set in 1991 on the eve of freddie mercury's death from aids oh wow 17 year old sasha is a huge fan of freddie mercury and she's going through the stages of grief as she learns about his passing and it is a coming of age story focusing around this group of girls Uh, Sasha and her friends are into the occult, but one of their friends, Haley, has been pulling away from them because she is starting to become a Christian convert, and she's getting very much into the uh, brainwashing that is going on there through (laughs) videos about the satanic panic, and Haley is trying to tell them all about how their souls are all in danger, and all of her friends, she's telling them that they're all going to hell because of the way they dress and the music they listen to. So this draws on issues of satanic panic and cult brainwashing and deprogramming, but in a weird sort of way, it's also kind of like an exorcism story, but... (laughs) In reverse, because... (laughs) Nice. So as Haley is becoming more and more rigorous in her beliefs and rigid in her view of Christianity and how that is making her friends, quote-unquote, evil in her eyes, (laughs) Sasha and their friends decide that they need to save Haley. And they kind of have to do like this inverse exorcism, but instead of saving her from Satan. They're trying to save her from these really rigid and harsh Christian beliefs. And in order to prove to her that her beliefs are horseshit, they go about summoning the devil. (laughs) (laughs) And and it just goes from there. It's a really, it's a blast. I mean, this story is just a hundred percent fun. It's irreverent. It's incredibly critical of organized religion, which is something that I, I think needs to be more of out there. I think we need to do (laughs) more questioning of these groups that presume so much power over us. And ultimately Lisa Quigley with this writes just uh, an absolutely remarkable fuck you to the institutional misogyny of Christianity by presenting it through this group of girls. And that's awesome. It's a blast. I had a lot of fun with this one. So that's my first recommendation for this week. I, in a rare show of force, thanks to a couple of, short novellas this week. I was able to read more than one thing. (laughs) Yay! So I was very happy about that after uh, a stint with some longer novels. It's nice to get back into quick novellas. Yes, it is. I've been staring at my uh, TBR, and I'm, like, trying to find the short ones, because, like, i got to clear this down a little, and if I I pick a really long one, I'm just going to be sad. Yeah, I know. I'm looking (laughs) at my NetGalley queue, and I'm just going to die before I ever get through it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it's so like, OK, I, I need a break from the novels for a little while and get into some more 
while the arcs are pleasure reading in a certain sense, they're also a commitment where it's like I am reading these strictly for review. Yeah. But I also need to do some pleasure reading where it's just like I don't have to review it if I don't want to. It's a little burden off my shoulders. I can just read it and have fun with it. Yeah, although that, I probably will review them, but it's <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things where it's like it's not as a hundred percent of a commitment. Where it's like if I don't review these, my net galley rating is going to tank. <laughs> so <laughs> it's already in the tank. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't want to make it worse. <laughs> yeah, I'll just take a little break and do some pleasure reading. Nice. So yeah. that's what this week has been about. That's good. I I just saw that she announced she's got another one coming out from Unnerving. Yes, Camp Neverland, I believe it's called, which also looks like it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. And she has a novel coming out through Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing in October. So Max Booth is going to be putting out her novel release. That's awesome. I'm yeah. really excited for that one. I think it's called The Forest. So that should give you an indication of what that one's going to be like. <laughs> hopefully you'll have some trees in it yeah hopefully it's <laughs> backwoods horror or middle of the forest horror i'm hoping for some maybe there'll be some killer trees that would be nice <laughs> can't go wrong with killer trees for sure <laughs> <laughs> i do think it's cool too though that 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 unnerving is continuing that rewinder die because i think that's hers is coming out through that too yes um I, I thought for some reason, I thought that was like a one year and done thing, but apparently that he's continuing it. Yeah, I think initially it had started out as a one year project, but it must have been pretty successful for Eddie Generous over at Unnerving to continue it. Yeah, which is which is cool. I mean, it was a ton of books. I remember last year, I think it was like 20 or 30. I think. Yeah, it was crazy. yeah there were 20 some. I think they're getting close to 30 now. They got to be. Wow. That's yeah, quite the thing to take on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At this point, I think I'm just kind of picking and choosing which ones I want to read from there. I was I did go in on the digital membership the first year and I never did read all of them. So at this point, I'm just going to kind of pick and choose which ones catch my eye or if it's from an author I know. Yeah, the oh, yeah. bundle stuff it, I, I like, but it's so daunting, too. I've done a couple of the like the humble indie bundles for authors or for books. And like, you know, you get a ton, you get like 10 or 15 books, but then you're like, crap, that's like 10 or 15 books. Right. Yeah. And then it's like on top of the 8,000 books that are already on my Kindle (laughs) that I haven't read yet. On top of the couple thousand of imprint books that I haven't read yet. (laughs) Yeah. I might have a slight issue with book hoarding, particularly uh, in digital. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy that way. <laughs> I know. Oh, my God. Some of these Kindle giveaways and yeah. cheap sales. It's like, oh, I'll buy this for 99 cents. OK, right? let me do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> like you're selling it for two dollars sold. Yeah. And it was like 20 books later by the end of the day. It's like, oh, fuck, I, <laughs> yeah. I have a problem. <laughs> And then I feel bad. Like it's that weird, like uh, and this will sound so funny, but it's like that weird cheating because I'm like, well, if I read all the stuff on a Kindle, then my normal books are just sitting there and I feel like I'm cheating on them. So then I'm like, well, I got to read those. But then I feel like, well, I got the stack of stuff on the Kindle and it's just I don't know how people do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't get it, but I've never been one of those types. The thing that I don't get are people who can read like six or seven books at a time. Yeah. Rich is one of those people like he'll check in every week with all of the new stuff he's been reading. But does he ever finish any of it? (laughs) I've been wondering that myself. (laughs) Like he'll mention that he started so and so book and then we never hear about it again. It's like, (laughs) Rich, what the fuck are you doing? (laughs) Like, I'll listen back to our old episodes and he'll talk about starting something and then either I'll remember, he'll either have. Talked about it in that recording, and then you know, like, because we record so far in advance, I like he's talking about it live, and I'm like, man, you, it's been weeks, and you're still on it, <laughs> <laughs> or like, yeah, we don't hear anything. I was like, oh, I wanted to hear what he was gonna say about that, or yeah. a lot of it is like, oh, I just haven't finished it yet. <laughs> yeah, I know there was some splatter westerns he had started that I was hoping we would get updates on, and then yeah. <laughs> never heard from them ever again. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> They disappeared into the void. <laughs> yes. 
I usually t- try to do like a short story collection or an anthology and something else. Yeah. If I'm reading a print book, I will do an anthology at night when I'm taking the kids to bed while I'm waiting for them to finally go to sleep after I've read them their story. I'll read something from an anthology on the Kindle in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll, that'll be my nighttime reading, then I'll do a print during the day. But that's about the only time that yeah. I can ever do multiple books. It's like kind of doing that weird math where you're trying to figure out, you're like, well, if I focus all my time on one book as opposed to three or four books, could I finish the one book and then get to the other ones faster than if I had three books going? Yeah. Like, I don't know where the math goes on that one. Which one adds, <laughs> which one I don't adds know. up? Is it better to read seven books at once and take three months to get through any of them? Or is it better to read them one book at a time and be done in half that time? I don't know. <laughs> right. Who knows? Half that time. I, I, yeah, I, I, th- I read somewhere that somebody was saying that that is a better way for your um, mental co- cognition is if you read multiple books because then your brain can focus on all of them better. But. I don't know if that's true. I, I mean, look, I'm 42. I'm not going to get smarter all of a sudden. <laughs> like, that's not going to be the key. That is like, <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm going to unlock extra brain power. That's not going to happen. It's like, that's the secret. That That's whatever the next uh, self-help book is. Read yeah. multiple books at the same time. No, I, whatever wrinkles I have in my brain, there. that's it. There's not going to be any more. <laughs> <laughs> True. I, I'm probably at that point. <laughs> my uh, brain has already gotten so wrinkled, they're starting to come out onto my face. So yeah, right. I can't imagine more books is going to help that. <laughs> it, there's like things collecting in those wrinkles, and it's just right. very weird. They are hard to clean. Things. My yes. next book, or books, I should say, because these two can be somewhat of a companion piece, is I... I'm currently reading Thomas Ligotti's Conspiracy Against the Human Race. Nice. Uh, and I just finished uh, Eugene Thacker's In the Dust of This Planet. So there's this three-part series, and that's the first part, uh, called Horror, Horror of Philosophy. And In the Dust of This Planet is the first one. Uh, I think it came out, man, probably about 10 years ago, but it actually has a quote of from Ligotti in the back. So, or a blurb from him. So I was like, all right, I'll give this a whirl. And it is a very good companion piece to, like I said, uh, Ligotti's nonfiction philosophy book, because they both kind of deal with that pessimistic philosophy of how we shouldn't be here (laughs) or like how consciousness is, was the, damnation of human beings so and in a nice light reading (laughs) right (laughs) a little bit you know just nice happy stuff about how we how in in the dust of this planet that one's more focused on how there's like the exploration of horror and like the three ties to us and the planet and how we like there's the world for us the world with us and then the world without us and how like in this one, it, he's exploring how horror kind of ties it, digs deeper into the world without us. And so he, he of course, pulls a lot of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and uh, other uh, – He was that that's like the big author he pulls in that. But then he pulls in a lot of horror movies and just talks about how like that basic concept of the unknown and or how the world doesn't really care about us and these things that happen – in horror movies or in real life are have really nothing to do with us. And that's just our own self-importance to think that the monster's here for us. And he's like, it's much scarier again, pulling from Lovecraft or other things where the world is just doing things and it really doesn't care if it kills us or not. So yeah, real light, happy reading and it, and, and stuff pulls it as well with some of the bedtime tea, right? <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. You just, pick up a chapter and just read that at night to your kids about (laughs) the indifference of the world and how we just shouldn't be here. And, and everything that we do is just fake. (laughs) Gather round children. (laughs) Let me tell you, (laughs) it's like the world is suffering and and we all try to fake that it's not, (laughs) which ties in a lot to the Ligotti one because that so far I'm, 
<laughs> that one's a tough one to get through. I'm not very far into it. I can only read a couple pages and then my head just hurts. Um, <laughs> he is a hundred percent pulling on the fact that like that consciousness is what dooms us and what distracts us from the fact that like we um, don't belong here and that our, that death is like our only choice. Um, <laughs> so real happy reading. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. <laughs> I, I like got through. Uh, there's like uh, he's got like a preface and an introduction in there, and that just like sets you up. He's like, this is the world. We we shouldn't be here, <laughs> and everything we do is just dumb and pointless. Uh, um, and then he goes on from there. <laughs> it's it's all very interesting. It's uh, it's 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 something. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah, you know, I was like, well, it, 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 yeah, I, I wanted to, I've had that one. I've had actually both of them on my cart for a while. And I don't know why I was like, I think I'm just going to start digging into these and see what they're all about. And in the dust of this planet, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. We're kind of pulling from these different philosophers and all this like stuff. And then I get into Lagatis and I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you read these, is it just for the intellectual journey or are there elements of the philosophy that are fundamental to you? Do you share these beliefs? That's a good question. I Some of these bringing to light some of my thoughts, uh, thought processes in the past and just observations for me. And some of it's just I want it to just to kind of see. I mean, like I, I, we've talked a lot about you know, especially Rich and I, our love of Ligotti and just kind of reading his stuff. So I kind of want it to, I've always been kind of intrigued on where his thought process is. I mean, like you get it in his stories, but like those are the fiction stories. And you kind of, I was always kind of like intrigued just to see what he's thinking. Like when I first read uh, Songs of Dead Dreamer and um, uh, uh, Grimscribe, it felt dangerous <laughs> you know and it sounds so silly <laughs> to say that but like you feel like you're reading something that you shouldn't and i haven't felt that for very many books or stories um in the past they all kind of just i, I <laughs> I'm, I'm a little it, it doesn't come across here but i have a little bit of like a robotic streak i would say i i'm pretty just like things don't affect me certain things affect me i'm scared of certain things but other things just kind of like are neutral for me. It's, it's a very weird thing, but oh, anyway, no. I, I remember you reading Laurel Hightower's latest book. And just <laughs> <trying> to, like, <laughs> Fair. That's that's yes. That's a good description. Everyone <laughs> else reading that is like fucking sobbing and drinking in the corner. It's like, nah, it was fine. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a perfect example. <laughs> that kid. I don't know. Whatever. What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it happens. It's tough. <laughs> whatever. Uh, get over it you'll be fine <laughs> but, but his stuff you like uh, uh, did kind of feel a little little dangerous to read so i was like anyway i kind of wanted to see his his self outside of fiction world and so that that was part of it was just reading that and some of the things that he br- they bring up in both of those are are intriguing um you know it's that kind of he he does reference different philosophies specific to like pessimistic ones and then optimistic ones and kind of you know obviously he's leaning towards pessimism but like he at least right now is kind of giving you the counter argument and i think that's like the big you know big thing in philosophy is always kind of coming up with all sides and all arguments and so it because it's really easy when you just read it from one side to be like, oh, yeah, I agree with all of this. We only get really the only uh, <laughs> one of Ligotti's comments. And I think he pulled it from a philosopher, but then he kind of expunged upon it. He's like, our only birthright really is to die. Everything else has been kind of chosen for us or it doesn't matter. And so, like, you kind of read some of that and you're like, oh, you're right. Like, you know, it our basic concepts of surviving or or, uh what is it it's surviving uh having children or procreating and then um dying and birth and he said like the first couple are only dependent on if you survive long enough to be able to procreate and so he's like in the end the really choice is that your only birthright is to die everything else is kind of like depends on that and i was like oh that kind of makes sense (laughs) i want to agree with that 
And so then that's where you go to the optimistic side where you're like, consciousness is great and we should enjoy that we're being alive and all that stuff. So anyway, like uh, it's we'll see by the time I get to the end <laughs> where I <laughs> where I sit on all of this. So far, it's all very intriguing and it's definitely giving you something to kind of think about that in the dust of this planet is a, I like that one more to pull, I would say pulling for writing style and concepts where I've liked that concept because you think about like animals like killing you or other animals and it's like they're not they're only doing that to survive and they don't really care about what it is and so like that concept of the monster it, that doesn't really care if you're around you know like I mean obviously you have like Freddy and Jason but they're there for you which is then kind of that hubris of like, well, the world is all against me or for me, where the concept of, I don't know, like a natural disaster, that was a big one, or even COVID right now, the concept that that really doesn't care about us. I think that's scarier. And that's a, like a good scare kind of tactic thing to go into where it, like you're, you don't matter to the point of like this thing is just going to roll over you and it really doesn't care that you slept with you know you're a teenager and you're not a virgin anymore you did drugs or you i don't know burned something and so now they're coming back for revenge it's literally just like well you're not it i don't care that you're here i'm just going to steamroll right over you and i was like that's a little terrifying yeah yeah that definitely gets into the lovecraftian cosmic horror beliefs i can see how they could tie that in there yeah so like he brought up a couple movies that somewhat pull into that or there was a show like i think a couple twilight zone episodes where it's this whole concept of like like i think he pulled in the blob and how it's like well it's just the blob it doesn't it's just doing its thing and it just so happens to like absorb people um yeah and, or You're like just in its way yeah exactly <laughs> so stuff like that so i mean like of course he kind of pulled in some of the like i'm trying to think of a couple of the lovecraft um stories that he pulled in but just that kind of thing where it's just like you're there and it just so happens that it is there too um so anyway that one's interesting to read for a writing standpoint i think the legati one's more of a like life choice are you gonna are you gonna believe all this and just think that the world is absolutely terrible and you shouldn't be around who knows (laughs) so yeah those are my light readings for this week awesome well i had a much lighter read (laughs) (laughs) with my second pick for the week uh is tim meyer's paradise club yes i had said earlier i've been kind of in like a summertime sort of reading and island horror is very much a part of that. So this kind of kicked off my my summer beach read horror movie and prose form. This one involves an FBI profiler and his family have won an all-inclusive resort vacation to a tropical island. It's not until they all get there that they realize that there's a little bit of a hitch to this <laughs> giveaway and that it's being run by a sadistic billionaire named Marco <laughs> Presley, who has invited these thousands of winners to the island for a single purpose, and that is to have them all murdered in a spectacular and gory a fashion as possible <laughs> as he unleashes a wave of violent serial killers upon his resort. Holy crap. So how many people are on? You said thousands of winners? Yeah, so he's got like this whole resort set up, and he's got it all filled so I think there's – I think there were about 2,000 people in there. Holy crap. Tourists, all their families and kids, and it's set up as kind of like a competition. So it's got like this little flavor of Die Hard meets The Purge, <laughs> but also like a bit that. of Survivor aesthetic to it. You know, they've nice. got to have – You've got this island with serial killers running around. You've got all of these people that are fleeing for their lives. But ultimately, at the end of it, like Highlander, there can be only one. (laughs) (laughs) And whoever is left standing at the end of it, that single solitary survivor, is the winner of the skirmish, it's called. Oh, wow. Um, So Elliot, along the way, he 
gets separated from his family and he runs into one of the survivors who is actually a survivor from a previous skirmish. Uh-huh. And she is on this island to try and get revenge against Marco Presley for all of the shit that went down in her previous competition. Uh, nice. She lost an eye in the battle and was forced to do some pretty heinous shit in order to survive. And she wants her revenge. <laughs> and standing in their way are all these slasher flick kind of killers. So you've got these a pair of clowns with bloody mallets that oh they just God. smash the shit out of people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like every time they're on scene, like they're caving in heads, they're turning people into pulp. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> You've got one guy who's dressed like a samurai warrior, so he's got this giant samurai sword that he runs around with, and chainsaw wielding maniac <laughs> who's just chopping people up on the beach. And it's wow, just, it's all over the place, and it there's some really good shocks that'll keep you guessing. There's some nice surprises sticking to that slasher flick kind of aesthetic. There's the big reveal as to what is going on here, what Marco Presley's real game plan is that I didn't see this coming kind of twist, but I don't want to give away what that was because it's fucking killer. (laughs) Interesting. But yeah, this book is a complete blast. It's very much a horror movie in prose form. It's right up there with that summer blockbuster kind of read that I've been looking for where you've got all this mayhem on the beach and this <laughs> island resort that people are trapped on and they can't escape from, and just so much blood. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> that is amazing. I think I remember seeing this come out and wanting to get it, but now I'm on board. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a blast. I think you're going to have a lot of fun with it. I never want to see another commercial for Sandals Resorts. Like, <laughs> like, like that is the ultimate takeaway from this book is I don't I've always wanted to do an inclusive resort vacation. And I thought maybe when the kids get a little bit older, it's something that we could do. And I'm like, nah, nah, fuck that. Um, <laughs> we're just going to stay home. We'll fill up the pools and that's it. You guys can have your little. There you go. Waiting pool and I'll hang out on the lawn and that's our vacation now. You you can make a tropical drink and you'll be good to go. Exactly. Exactly right. (laughs) Oh, man, that sounds amazing. It sounds a little a little like uh, Battle Royale, but not quite. Um, Yeah. From what I know of Battle Royale, I have not read it or seen the movie, but I could see that kind of comparison being drawn, I think. Yeah. That seems to have been kind of an influential work for stuff like The Purge from what I know of it. So, yeah, I could see that kind of tying into it. It's like that and Slash Fiver. Did you read that from Stephen Kozanowski? No, not yet. It's not a summer read, <laughs> but it, I mean, like, and it, it doesn't sound exactly the same, but it's got that kind of a little bit of that concept going where serial killers and people put up against the serial killers. But in this one, they're being watched for t- TV. So kind of Running Man-esque. Okay. Uh, but no, this sounds amazing. I am. Oh. Fully on yeah. board. It's a complete blast. It's only, I think it's like 250 pages, so it's pretty short. You can tear through it pretty quickly. And it was one of those books that I didn't want to put it down, so I was able to get through it pretty fast. <laughs> I like this idea of summer summer horror reads. I should yeah. follow this. Well, I gave you my list earlier. Those are the things yeah. that I'm going to be planning out for a few days here if you want a buddy read. I might. We'll see. I might need. Yeah, I might need a break. <laughs> the depressingness. Yeah. Well, this is a definite cure all. Right. I mean, these are some really light, fun, <laughs> fun romps. This is definitely not Ligotti. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, which is good. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I, you missed one that I was thinking of. I think it's Pat Lacey has Lords of the Deep, I think. Oh, no, I, you're right. I do have that on here. OK, there might be a couple I didn't mention just because I didn't scroll down far enough. <laughs> Come on. We want the whole list. Oh, did I give you uh, Richard Lehman's Island? You did not. OK, so I got that one. Um, <laughs> Lords of the Deep. That one's on here. 
and I hope I say her name right, Laura Morrow. Yeah. She's got a short story called Ninjin. Ooh. N-I-N-G-E-N, um, which I think is about a submarine that they're uh, rescue, deep sea rescue. Nice. Another Adam Caesar for that island horror with tribesmen. Excellent. Uh, a pair of Matt Serafini books. Did I mention these? Did not. Island Red and Ocean Graves. Ooh. And Aaron Dries, A Place for Sinners, is another one that I put on here. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that sounds like a fun a fun thing. I am I feel kind of guilty because I've got these arcs. I was like, no, I want sea horror, though. These arcs aren't sea horror, so. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I want to just do something fun for summer. You know, it's like doing uh, October reads and you're like, I I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. It's like people, we compile all these Halloween, the best horror books for Halloween. This is my summer version of it. I want a secluded island. I want people who are either trapped on it or (laughs) who are there by choice. And I want them to meet awful ends by creative creatures or psychopaths or monsters whatever i'm good with all of it you know it could be a sea monster it can be a shark i don't care yeah either one is good i read them over the last few years i think he's stopped doing them but christopher golden was writing under a pen name chris jameson and for like three years he was doing a shark book each summer through saint martin's press that's amazing those were phenomenal reads i mean (laughs) I guess as phenomenal as a shark horror book is going to get, <laughs> yeah. I don't know like that they're going to win literary prizes or get much merit, but they're fun. They're a complete blast. I loved the hell out of each one of them. And I wish he would have kept it going. Like I would love to have gotten like 10 of these things, but oh, man, that would have been awesome. But it's a nice little trilogy that he did as Chris Jameson. So they're really fun. I would recommend those. They're, they're great summer. They're the epitome of a summer sea monster read uh i love it that is amazing you know what else turned out to be a pretty good summer read even though it's not oh. set by the water i i wonder what could it be beyond the triangle oh. by richard gerlock who you might have heard from from past episodes of this show just a couple <laughs> our our frequent co-host richard gerlock <laughs> <laughs> semi-frequent had you ever heard? I feel like he's talked about this before, but I was this is new. Like outside of him, I would have never have heard of this before. This triangle. I have. I thought you meant like him or the story. or okay. the book. No, yeah, I've never heard of this story before. I haven't even heard of dark words until this asshole mentioned it. What yeah. is this thing? What the hell? <laughs> It's like it's new or something. Matt, well, what a Matt, what's a what's his name? Who? <laughs> yes. There's only one Matt, and that's me. That's right. Well, also Matt Bartlett. That's true. There should be an anthology of us Matts. Killer Matts. Killer Matts. And, <laughs> and it's all about <laughs> it's all about doormats and floor mats. <laughs> oh God, yeah. There's an exciting read. Killer floor mats. <laughs> Jesus, like <laughs> you go King with... Prime Cokehead era. <laughs> it's like the killer elevator and the killer sofa and the killer, killer tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, killer tornadoes. <laughs> killer tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes. tomatoes. George Clooney's cinematic debut, Matt. Uh, that, the, hey, those are great movies. I mean, the fuzzy tomato. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to answer your original question, no. I have not heard of this particular lore before, and I, it's apparently quite well known in Massachusetts, but being from Michigan, yeah. I had never heard of this. I'm guessing our region is probably why we haven't. <laughs> yes, it, but it's, it, according to Rich, it's huge. It sounded like it's 200 miles. Yeah, it's apparently a really big area. So I had done a little bit of research to find out, like, is he just pulling our leg is this a real <laughs> thing did he just completely fool matt wilderson with this nonsense he got published? <laughs> yeah. the bridgewater triangle is a real thing uh atlas obscura even wrote about it nice and they write i'm gonna read from them 
And they say that for centuries, locals have reported strange activity in and around the swamp, from Bigfoot sightings to Native American ghosts, strange orbs that weave through the trees, UFOs, unmarked black helicopters, satanic rituals, and cattle mutilation. In 1980, Boston Magazine reported that Police Sergeant Thomas Downey spotted a six-foot-tall winged creature while driving late at night on a country road. Some paranormal aficionados asserted that this was the mythical Thunderbird, prominent in local Native American mythology. And we get from this story that there is quite a lot of Native American mythology that plays into it, along with uh, British attacks against local tribes. Yes, which I I like that he he tied that that idea in because like, you know, I mean, it from your description and then even from a little bit of the description in because uh, and I, I'm again, we talked about this. We haven't flipped through all of dark words yet, but there's at least an intro to each. It seems like to maybe to each story, at least a richest story where he describes the the Bridgewater, I'm going to keep calling it Bermuda Triangle, thinking <laughs> that <in> my head, <laughs> but the Bridgewater Triangle, and and it it sounds like it's got a lot of craziness in it, but then like he also he kind of uh, cements it into this tragedy that happened, and I don't, it was like 1600s or something like that. Yeah, I think some of the weirdness that is associated with this area, he's kind of scaled it back a little bit. Yeah, there's still plenty of weirdness going on here. Um, But for those that know Massachusetts, this is apparently an area that's about 200 square miles with the peak in Abington and the two base corners in Rebooth and Freetown, covering almost all of Rayham and Tauntaun, which is not to be confused with the creatures that they ride (laughs) at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. Or for their warmth. When you cut them up, yeah, uh, they smell even worse on the inside. <laughs> I, uh, yes, <laughs> the mighty Tauntaun. Uh, <laughs> this is me uh, admitting my lack of geography and or size of states, but I feel like Massachusetts is, was smaller than two hundred miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the like, map, it's like not even the size of a postage stamp. How does this thing have a triangle in it? Right? I'm like, is it the whole state? <laughs> I Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what the square mile of Massachusetts is. <laughs> so, but yeah, when, when I saw that, I was just like, man, is that, yeah, that's got to be the whole the whole states in this triangle, but maybe it's not. It's sizable, right? Yeah, that's that's big, Um, which is a little terrifying to think about because it has these little a little furry guys in it. Um, Yeah, uh, the Puckwudgies. Yes, Puckwudgies, these (laughs) tiny. Yeah. So, yeah. So this story, basically this Bridgewater Triangle, like we said, a bunch of weird stuff is in it. And the story kind of posits once you pass the barrier, you're you're sort of. In another dimension. Uh, Yeah, that was kind of what I was thinking. Also, it's kind of like a thinny, a little thin spot they pass through as they navigate this triangle. Yeah. So, which is, again, when you think about the size, it's like, (laughs) it's everybody in this place. But we get a kind of tie at the end. But anyway, to back up. So we have our main character, James, is searching for somebody, and he calls the help of his friends, Devin and Clara, who have told James that they've been in this place. And but so they, they weren't. They're, they're liars. They, Spoiler uh, yeah. alert. <laughs> so they uh, are big, dirty liars. <laughs> they've researched it. Um, yeah. They've wanted to go. But – a, what, in which we find out is they needed a connection to get in there. And so James is their connection because he lost somebody in there, which we'll find out in a little bit. And so then we we step in and then it just starts getting a little weirder and weirder. There is wind where there shouldn't be trees that just keep going and going. At one point they lose Devin, just disappears. I What was I liked was he has this handkerchief that he uses and the wind kind of points them in the direction. So they, at first James 
uh, obviously is like, why are we following this? And do you all see this? But they're just like, oh, it's cool. You just follow this, the wind. It tells you where to go. And so they follow that. And then eventually we get into this clearing. And that's where we kind of get this tie to the past where we see, I mean, basically pilgrims uh, attacking the Native Americans, the indigenous people in that land. And it's just this ultra violent attack that happens. And while that's happening, James hears a voice and realizes that they are pretty much trapped in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's posited that that attack and the blood spilt, Richard writes during the King Philip's War, had forever tainted the land. Yeah. Creating this place that has remained stuck in time. So these pilgrims and Native Americans are kind of caught in a sort of time loop. Yeah. Kind of where they're attacking and dying over and over for all of eternity or at the very least it's a vision that is played out by the woods for james yeah it reminded me of oh my gosh what did we just was that in good indian the only good indians where they were seeing something play out over and over again or am i reading or is that something else? It's something Jones, Stephen Graham Jones has done a trick like that before. Um, was it Interstate Love Affair? Maybe. Or the only good in, or not the only good Indians. Um, mapping the interior. Yeah. Maybe Isn't that the one? Yeah. Uh, the kid was like dreamwalking and he got into his father's head or the guy who attacked his father. Yeah. He was able to see that scenario play out. Yeah, I think it was that. I'm just like, oh, no. Oh, wait, no, it was. Oh, I'm going to draw a blank. It was something else I've read where they kept seeing this thing play out and eventually they had to like. It was some short story I read. Never mind. Um, OK. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was it, there was like the short story. Oh, was it a Barker story? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to draw that out. <laughs> There's a story where I read that this sort of happens where they keep seeing stuff play out and then eventually they figure out like a way to change that. Mm. But anyway, it reminded me of that, whatever that story was. And I'm going to it's going to drive me nuts because I feel like I just read it. Well, <laughs> at least it'll be a short trip. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not very long, like a minute. Uh, <laughs> So so anyway, yeah, I, I, the, the other thing we get interspersed is these kind of previous happenings. So we get this uh, kind of what happened two weeks ago, what happened three weeks ago. So that's when we see Devin and Clara uh, get the call from James and they're like, oh, we're finally going to get in. And that's kind of like, which is your clue that, hey, they have no idea what's going on. And then we get a shot with James and the person that he is trying to find is I'm going to draw a blank. What was his name? Uh, it's his boyfriend, Ryan. Ryan. Yes. So yeah. we, we, get we little flashbacks that tell us the background of why flashbacks. James is in this woods in these yeah. woods. I was and looking for that word, by the way. What's that? Flashback? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, there's an obvious word to describe this, but I'm picking the worst way to go about it. What is it when you get these flashes that go back? What, what is that called? I'm like, we get these previous, uh, previously seen on. Yeah. It's like with these TV shows that they do this. <laughs> um, a recap. That's, a not, re that's not that's quite not what I'm right. looking for. That's close, but it's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> Me is short. It's like a flash piece of something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's backwards. Um, so you get yeah. these little flashbacks that Ryan, we can infer initially, and then it is clarified later, but when we're initially presented with this scene between James and Ryan, um, we learn that Ryan has just come out to his family, and his family has not reacted well to it at all. Uh, and now he is in the process of packing up his belongings and leaving his parents' house. And he's going to move into their friend Jennifer's place because her parents are cool with his lifestyle and his sexuality. And they're not going to be the complete dickwads that Ryan's parents are. <laughs> and along the way, apparently, he takes a little trek through the woods and disappears 
into yeah. the Bridgewater Triangle. It took me a minute to figure out their ages. And so this. I yeah. want to say they're like 17 or 18. Yeah. I like Jen. I think she was just they refer to her 17th birthday was going on upstairs at some point. Yes. I don't think James and Ryan are much older than that. They all seem like they're pretty young. High yeah. school, early college. I think I think they are in college. This James, Ryan, Devin, and Clara, I think they're college age. Okay. Yeah. I And that's why I was trying to run her because we get – when we see Clara and Devin, I feel like they're living in a – like a trailer they're living. Yeah. Yeah. They're in a Winnebago. Yes. That's the word Winnebago. So yeah, that, so like I, that's where I was, I was, and then I figured it out. But at first I, for some reason I was like, Oh, maybe they're a little bit older and they're exploring around. And then I was like, Oh, they're younger. And so anyway, that was just, (laughs) it took me a minute to figure out their ages. But that first scene with where, where the first flashback with James um, on the phone, he's texting with Ryan I thought that was really good. That was like a cool because like you're only getting a, just these texts and they're even like ha- like he's not even getting responses. But it's giving us we're infer like you said, inferring enough that we're like, oh, man, something something isn't right. Something is going on. Um, and it, it, I thought that was really powerful. Um, yeah. And then obviously when we actually see uh, later on, I think he tells James kind of like. Yeah, they did not take it well, and I'm out of here. Uh, um, so yeah. like we we get that, but yeah, that first first flashback, I was like, oof, that's rough. I really dug the hell out of this first flashback. There is so much empathy in the yes. writing to this scene, and Rich doesn't hit you over the head with any of it. It's very subtly done, yeah, which I think makes it all the more powerful as you read through it and you pick up on what's going on. It's like, Oh shit, this this poor kids. Yeah. So yeah. That and then, was, you know, that they wind up in the Bridgewater triangle. It's like, Oh yeah, things are going to get a little bit worse <laughs> before it gets any better. This is not going to be a good ride. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it isn't. So like that, the, uh, replaying of the, uh, the attack, the battle, Rich starts exploring a little bit splatter, which is fun. And then when we get the the what the fug, the Agamucks, what are the little guys again? Uh, shit, hold on, I gotta go back to like the first <laughs> the intro. Uh, the pudge, the puck wudgies, the puck wudgies, that wudgies, straight on. Hit Rich exploring splatter to to its to its goopy expansive <laughs> oh yes yeah no that is his goopy goblin brain in full effect right there <laughs> yes it's it's fun like having having us discuss stories for the last couple of years and then reading this seeing like where his influences are um and what he's pulling from so like that yeah. one that whole like so because that is um and, and we're jumping all over the place but he eventually they Clara and James, they find Devin. <laughs> they find a lot of Devin. <laughs> they, he, yeah, he is tied up uh, like on a table and these these puck wedgies are dissecting him. <laughs> yeah. And they're they're doing a lot with him there. <laughs> yes. You know, you get uh, I like what you mentioned there about his influences and you can see like even more recent influences I can yeah. get some Hunter Shea in this Puck Wudgies. Yeah. Scene here there's a bit of, uh, uh, what was it, the Misfits yes. that he did with the Melon Heads. Yep. Kind of some of that. And even to a certain degree, although he doesn't really follow the style of it, but reading Negative Space, I wonder how much of this story yeah. was by Negative Space. I was thinking that, too, because there is, like, we explore cutting and... Not much suicide, a little bit at the very end, suicide, but yeah, definitely kind of that depression and things to do to get out of that depression is explored. And then, yeah, this puck wedgie thing, I was thinking uh, along of like Freak Show and Urban Gothic and even um, not 
too much of the pig, but a little bit of that goriness. Just <laughs> I mean, like they're, they're trying to deglove his face. They're playing jump rope with his intestines. Yes. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so so you get you get that. And, and then like the battle, I mean, you just see battle stuff where people are getting torn apart and smashed and, and stuff. But um, the, the musket ball with like brains bursting out everywhere. <laughs> yes. So, so that's definitely in there. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember us reading these stories. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Pukwudgies, uh, James and Clara are trying to run from this death scene. Yes. And they end up leaping after Clara and cutting her Achilles tendon. Yes. And it doesn't get that's pretty much the end for her. But yeah, after they slice her throat open. And <laughs> what was all the stuff with the jazz music? I was wondering that too. And that's where just to show our listeners, we're not going to all be praising of rich. Uh, I, did, <laughs> I <laughs> you know, we're going to be what we normally do. And I, I was wondering that too. I felt like that, that was something that I wasn't quite sure where that went. Yeah, I wasn't entirely clear on that. It's like 1920s era jazz, so it's not yeah. even like current time. And I don't know. I couldn't quite put my finger on what Rich was getting at with the jazz music, if it was an indication of somebody who had been lost there earlier. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, because like, it doesn't tie into the start of the Bridgewater Triangle with the tragedy, the, the King Philip stuff. Right. I was like, it, that's way earlier. Way than past that. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, after King Philip, we had jazz. Yeah, he's just just jamming out some jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I and, and yeah, and then it doesn't tie into. I wouldn't think it tied into Ryan because we get that part, which we'll get to in a second. So yeah, I don't know. Like I didn't know if he was just putting that in there just to be creepy, or or yeah, if there was another meaning in there for j- the jazz music. Well, I'll tell you what, if I'm lost in the woods and I suddenly hear fucking jazz music, I'm running. <laughs> yeah, oh, seriously. That is a creepy, creepy fucking thing. To yeah, <laughs> just out of nowhere, like 1920s jazz music. Yeah. Pipe it through. I mean, and he, he has it get distorted and just like it. It's definitely a creep factor. For It's sure. a neat touch, but it's also a, a curiosity that. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. If it was something that what we learn later about the I guess it's safe to call it a spirit of the yeah. woods, this entity that yeah. inhabits the triangle. Maybe it was a jazz aficionado. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just really like that jazz. Somebody, when I killed somebody, they were listening to it on their record player, and so I took it. You know, if they would have had the foresight to bring some Thelonious monk, everything would have been <laughs> fine. Right? Everyone would have been cool, just like, oh, you know, never mind. <laughs> Another tidbit, and this was just like a really, 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 really tiny thing that caught my eye and I wasn't sure I know we were not at all familiar with this Bridgewater triangle concept beforehand at the beginning, when they're walking into it, James has mentioned that he wasn't sure what to expect. And he thought maybe he would see some weird cracks in the ground or the red hitchhiker. Yeah. That was another element. I was like, wait, what the fuck is a red hitchhiker? (laughs) I was wondering that too. What? I, so you haven't heard of that either. I don't know no. if that's another local legend or something yeah. associated with the triangle or if I'm just completely off my game on urban legends. Yeah, no, that maybe that's a very localized to Massachusetts. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the Red Hitchhiker is. I mean, it's interesting. I have my I can imagine different things, but I don't know if any of them are correct. <laughs> You know, and that's like I, can be the tricky thing with Doing bringing in local things. Yeah, because like, and I was, what was I? I was just reading something, and and it's a, kind of the same idea where you're like, if you're not from that area, you might not know what that means. And at the same, yeah, so it that's tricky because uh, you don't want to explain it either because it's like, why would these 
people explain it. It's like <laughs> I've been been rewatching the Fast movies and they repeatedly will do this thing where they're like, all right, let's go over to plan again because you don't remember it. And it's like, OK, you're just doing that for us, which is fine. And that feels over explaining where this maybe was just a little like, what is the Red Hitchhiker? OK, well, you know what? I fucking Googled it because I want to know. <laughs> And it is very much a Massachusetts Bridgewater Triangle reference. People from New England. uh, Hold on. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to edit this part out because I don't know. I should have read this before I started reading it, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so it's I guess the full name is the redheaded hitchhiker of Route 44. Uh. Um, there have been claims for as long as people can remember of a redheaded man walking down U.S. Route 44 in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, and some have stopped to pick him up only to have him disappear on them. Okay. So I think that that's got to be just another localized legend that yeah. the characters and the author is familiar with. That was just kind of a stumbling point for me. It's like, well, wait a minute. What the fuck is what's yeah. a red hitchhiker mean? I mean, and that sounds like the generic hitchhiker legend. Yeah. Yeah. I I started thinking, like, maybe it was the man with the hook. Yeah. So, like, yeah, like the I mean, like when the like, uh, what was it? One of the Marys from the Pretty Marys all in a row from Gwendolyn Kleist um, concept. So, yeah, I actually I kind of forgot about that till you just mentioned it. But yes. And if. Readers want to learn more about the redheaded hitchhiker of Route 44. I found uh, a link to SpookySouthCoast.com that can tell you more. And right on this page, of course, over in the margin, is a link to purchase the Bridgewater Triangle. I've read Amazon.com. Apparently, there is a movie from 2013 that talks about this. What? Yeah. See, (laughs) that's crazy. So, all right, that that that's interesting, and that that was one of the other things I kind of stumbled a little bit on at the beginning. Your exact comment about the cracks in the Red Hitch Hiker is clearly this is somewhat known in that area. I feel like wouldn't have James known a little bit more about it, but, you know, I don't know. I guess I don't know all the legends around here, so. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain compromise that has to be made between yeah. explaining it for people who aren't familiar with it and knowing what to explain this is versus true. Versus giving too much information and yeah. trying to be a smarty pants know it all. Like, oh, look at all my trivia. Oh, right. Exactly. <laughs> so, and that, like, yeah. And honestly, that didn't, I mean, almost like the Red, hit, the hit red Hitchhiker, where I remember stumbling a little bit on it, but then I forgot until just now. And that's the same for this. So it's like, maybe if you I know, hadn't highlighted it, I wouldn't even remember it right now. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, and him not knowing everything about it. That's really tiny. Like it, we don't know everything around our areas. And, and if nobody's actually been in it, at least of these three people, then of course they're going to all have their own assumptions. So it's a minor, minor inconvenience of, of this that I brought up. But yeah, I think then we get into this weird bit where James does find Ryan and he is attached to a tree. Um, Yes. Next to – or wait, let me back up because they find the cell phones all hanging from a tree too, right? Yeah, they find his Ryan cell phone. Because they find that one and they find Devin's, I think. They find Devin's handkerchief. Handkerchief, that's it. Yep. Okay. One of the other neat things that I liked was that they talk about the wind blowing the handkerchief and showing them the direction. But even creepier are the branches that all point in one direction (laughs) and it follows that guideline. Yes. I thought that was a really creepy, really nice touch. And this is one of the fucking reasons I do not go camping and will never, (laughs) ever go camping is because the woods are fucking terrifying, all right? They are. They are. <laughs> between Predator, between this kind of shit. Like, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing woods. Predators in the jungle, you'll be fine. The jungles are the same goddamn thing as a forest, all right? There is fundamentally no difference. There's a lot of trees and there's a lot of creepy shit, and I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> 
It's uh, not happening. That's fair. There, there's bears and stuff in the woods. You don't want to mess with those. Oh, bears are the least of the problems. <laughs> the predator is the most. The, pre- the predator is going to take out the fucking bear and then it's going to come for you. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> they can- I am under no illusions about this, okay? I am not Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I'm i the guy that dies in the first reel, okay? Like, there is no question in my mind. I mean, you could be like Topher Grace and figure out a way to work with the Predator. Was he in one of those? Yeah, he was in the Robert Rodriguez one. Oh. And he was like a serial killer, but like a nice kind of serial killer. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that, that one, like... He had a good concept. I feel like they just they that's the one where they went to the Predator's planet, right? Yeah, they were all pulled into the planet and then they were all hunted. But like it just I feel like the studio, which sucks because he usually kind of controls everything he does. But I have a feeling that he couldn't control this one. And so they they cut out some of the cooler stuff he had planned. So like Danny Trejo was supposed to have. Instead of just one chain gun like Jesse Ventura has, he's supposed to have like two straps <laughs> his back. One for each hand. <laughs> well, like, he was like going to have like a whole backpack and like they were going to oh, be up on his shoulders. It, <laughs> it would have been awesome, but wow. they cut that out. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to bring up the cell phone thing because that was another really strong uh, emotional part because James grabs the cell phone and sees the text messages and it yeah. just. You know, rushes back to him and i thought that was really that was a great moment it's also a neat reminder of just how wonky time is in this triangle yes like i'm trying to judge the timeline of when all this shit went down like Uh, ryan has i'm guessing been missing for at least a week yeah Uh, James, Devin, and Clara, they pulled this plan together to go into the woods only two days before they went into the woods. Yeah. And this guy's cell phone is still functioning. (laughs) Which I'm not using as a knock against Rich or trying to look for a plot hole logic here, but I think it does tie into just how crazy this triangle is and how fluid time yes. functions you've got like i think there is no time in this place like yeah everything is all happening kind of at once in this region you know you've got you still have this battle from the 1600s playing out you've got this phone that's still working i think that that's helping to emphasize that there is no linear time all of this is concurrent everything that is happening is happening all at once Yeah, and he introduces, and I'm trying to find it, if he called it the White Place. Does that sound right? Yeah, the. so they find Ryan. He has been impaled by one of the trees. Yeah. And is just kind of hanging out. Like, the the tree limb is kind of using him as, like, a puppet. Yeah, slash eating him. Yeah, and uh, the spirit of the triangle is using... Ryan's body to communicate to James. Yeah. Explaining their choices here. It's like you can either go back out into the world and forget everything, or you can stay here and be reunited. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just flipping through, and it, it has been a, it was a week. Ryan says he's been here for a week. Okay. But then they, uh, then he brings up this, the white space where it's, out out of time yeah a space beyond time before man after man the infinite yes and so then yeah i thought that was uh interesting kind of idea of like you can stay here or not i'm sorry I'm just <laughs> there's some neat pretty subtle commentary to this choice right yes. like they are granted permission to be back together by this entity and their being given this choice is because James and Ryan have that special bond. Their love is pure. Yeah. The world has bent and twisted and broken both of them, but together they can create a whole and they can embrace their love and die together in this place. Or James can leave and live with the knowledge of 
the Bridgewater triangle, which I'm guessing is probably not going to do his brain too much good to go back yeah. out into the world learning all of this. Like, especially, yeah, because like you kind of get this reference to all of the all of the atrocities that are happening within this triangle and even in the world and how that's all kind of everything bad that's happened has tied has create I think has created the white space. So, yeah, anyway, so just knowing that that's all there and what what they've created, what the world has created and having to live with all of that. I thought that was interesting. But I like this idea that these two gay men that in order to find acceptance in order to be together, they have to leave society. Yeah. And they have to return to a primitive nature that completely predates mankind and mankind's judgments. Yes. That in order to live free and be together, (laughs) they have to escape society. They have to escape mankind. Yeah. Which is, it's a touching, and it's one of those sadly romantic kind of things that I'm trying to think of uh, the philosopher. Um, ah, His name's not going to come to me, but... (laughs) Anyway, that's probably beside the point, but I thought it was a really neat concept that he's hitting on here, especially reading this kind of like the start of Pride Month and issues of homophobia and bigotry and that in order for these two, like the only the one that really accepts them, you know, Ryan is driven out of his home by his parents. They can't accept that he's gay. And the only one that is really finding their love to be pure and special is this ancient, for lack of a better word, alien yeah. entity. Yeah. And like who, and, and yeah, and the concept that they were both damaged and broken. Yeah. And that's why, like, it feels like that, that and their love, that's why it's accepting them and it's allowing them to be together. Yeah. Um, and that it was the world that bent and twisted them. It was what mankind has done to them. I think he hit on a really neat topic with this. I think it works really well. There's, like I said earlier, there's a lot of empathy that goes into this and Mm -hmm. you have to have that to create good horror. Yeah. It, it isn't just all the splattery parts, although there is plenty of really good splattery elements. (laughs) in this. There's also a great deal of heart, which I think, really helps lift it up. I think he did a great job with it. I liked the story a lot. Yeah. A few niggling elements aside, like the red hitchhiker, which I had to Google. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like that. And exactly. I mean, it just a a couple little, a couple of the little things in there that are honestly, it's, it's doesn't affect the story in a negative way. You just, you know, the jazz, the red hitchhiker kind of thing. You're just like, wait, what? But overall, yeah, I really liked it. And I think he, he explored some really interesting concepts. Um, Cause yeah, I was thinking about that too, with like just that idea of them having to basically sacrifice each other and die to feed this thing. And like, I almost wish he explored that even a little bit more. Like, I think it's here, but I think he could have, he, if this could have been a longer story, because I don't know what the word count was or anything like that. I like I think he could play a lot more in that stuff and that that idea of what this white space is feeding on and what that means for them and like why it chose them because you know it's it, it there's some interesting thoughts with that and then the the opposite of what Devin and Clara had to go through and why it chose James and Ryan as opposed to them or why weren't they also chosen? I think that, and I think those are all really interesting kind of ideas to explore. And if you want it to go longer, I think it would be really cool to see where that all led. And then I also like, cause he, so he ends it with them embracing and then it goes to the next day with the police getting reports of people, what was it? People screaming and finding bodies And so they go in and that's where they find Ryan and James are like fused together. But what what I thought was interesting and again, something it would be cool to see and explore is the fact that it feels like the white space and the 
the Bridgewater Triangle are choosing people because it's like, why didn't the sheriff go into the white space if he found these bodies? Well, what's interesting, too, is that Devin and Clara, when they're found, they're found hanging from the trees. Yeah. But James and Ryan have been fused into like a single body, a single entity. They're fused together on the ground. They've been returned to the earth, which I think is philosophically interesting. There's some meaning going on in there that I haven't (laughs) completely sussed out, but it's certainly an interesting visual. Yes. I think there's some deeper ideas at play there that I'm not entirely sure (laughs) what all the commentary is, but I I suspect there is commentary there. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, exactly. And that's kind of what I was, was like, Oh man, it would be cool just to kind of get more of that and get more of like who, who's picked, who is, who's chosen and like why they're chosen. And because it sounds like it almost seems like it comes and goes, which sounds kind of clear to some of the legends that are tied to it and who sees them and who doesn't. So I think that's an interesting, interesting avenue that could be explored that we get a bit here, which is, you know, what I like. And we've, you know, when you talk about short stories, you get just a snippet and it allows you to kind of explore more mentally what's happening as the reader. And that's the kind of, what's done really well here is we can, we we're getting this choice uh, or this scene, but clearly there's a lot more happening. Yeah. Well, it ends with the line that the triangle went to sleep, which automatically prompts the question of what causes it to awaken. Yeah, exactly. And I think with this idea and some of the elements that he's put in here that weren't explored completely, like the jazz music and the red hitchhiker and, what all of the various legends surrounding the Bridgewater Triangle are all about. He's got plenty of room to come back and explore more from this if he wanted to. Yeah, exactly. I certainly would read another entry into this if he took a series route with it. Yeah, I I think it's neat, you know, and and what I really like, too, is and because I keep in my head, keep saying Bermuda Triangle uh, (laughs) Is that we don't, I mean, outside of that area, I know nothing about the Bridgewater Triangle. So I think that, which is one of those cool things to explore is finding something a little different and then expanding on it for everybody. So this is, because it is, there's just so many different things that are happening here to, to, to look at. You know, the, the one thing that I was trying to decide and it's similar to like the jazz music and the red hitchhiker was the um, fuzzy wugs or whatever they're called. The puck wudgies. Uh, the puck wudgies. I, I was, I've been trying to decide if I, the scene was cool. I really liked it. I liked the splatter and everything, but I was trying to decide if that actually fit in with everything else that was happening. And so again, not good or bad. Just try. I was like, I really liked the, the creepy, he had a really interesting atmosphere going and it was really kind of ethereal ghost like atmosphere with the the go with the the battle replaying and then with the even with the jazz music if he wanted to go that way and just the trees and the wind. So like, you know, he could have gone in a couple different directions with that. And so when I got to the the Pukwajis, I was like try, I've been trying to decide if that worked. Or if that's something he should explore in another whole story. Like, I just couldn't decide. I felt yeah. like it felt a little, and I'm not trying to be mean, Rich. I know if you listen to this, I really liked it. But I, I'm just trying to decide if that fit in with everything else that was happening um, in this story. Well, I think the fact that we kind of want to see the story unconstrained by a word count yeah, should be taken as a positive. <laughs> exactly. There is a lot more that could be explored, and I would love to have a deeper crash course on this mythology that's going on here. Yeah, because I think because there is a lot there's a lot he can explore. I mean, and we get it all here. It's like this is almost like a almost like a greatest hits of the Bridgewater Triangle, just because he's hitting on a lot of different things that are that happen there. So, like, you could put any if I'm going to stick with the greatest hits, you could pick any song and just explore that one song. And I would totally be down for that. I think, yeah, 
I, I just I was trying to decide if that one particular song in this greatest hits needed to be there or if it felt like a weird outlier. <laughs> well, I was also thinking about the jazz music a bit more and some of his inspirations, and I I can't help but wonder if Matt Bartlett played some kind of a role. Yeah. If maybe that's some kind of side reference to Leeds, Massachusetts. And I really now want to know where the fuck Leeds lies in relation to this <laughs> yes. triangle. Like, <laughs> oh, that's a great point. And, you know, I was thinking about maybe that too. the jazz music is coming from WXXT. <laughs> oh, man, that would be amazing. There's a broadcast tower in the triangle, maybe. <laughs> yeah, totally makes sense. <laughs> well, and that's that's the thing too. I, I kept and we we touched on it earlier, but looking at this and looking at what we know of his inspirations and some of the stuff he's commented on, I think that's a good point with the Bartlett. Did he do that? And even like the white space made me think. And I don't know if he's read this or not. I can't remember when we talked about it, but the Todd Kiesling's uh, Life Transparent, he has that space. It's not the white space there. I think it's like the gray space. And so I, I was thinking of that, too. I was like, oh, did he was that an inspiration? Because it's almost a little bit of a similar concept. Not completely, but just when I was reading it, I kind of picked up a little bit on that. And then I also I was wondering with the jazz music, I was like, well, is he trying to like capture a little bit of Legati because I Whenever I think of his stories, I think of either jazz or like weird violin music playing. Um, so well, I was, I was thinking of that too. The fact too that it's a white space is interesting in its own right, because we think of something as white as being illuminating. Yeah, and they're shedding knowledge on something here that this entity is perhaps educating James and Ryan on whatever is going on. Especially considering it, it's the it's what brings up all the atrocities that Rich references in here. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah, I know, like a white space, you would presume that as being like the light side of the force, right? It's something that's positive. Yeah. <laughs> I was totally thinking that. I was like, it's an interesting choice when you consider it a typical kind of looks at like magic and or the force. You kind of, you know, you have the white magic and then the black magic. and Right in the dark side and the light side. And this, he, he twists that maybe, maybe not. It's kind of a up to you, depending on like the fact that they're dead, that it's feeding off of them. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. So very Lagardian yeah. philosophy as we dig into it, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. You're like, hmm, interesting. So yeah, I really, I, I think this is, was an awesome a uh, debut and yes. you know it, it i congratulate him for getting this out there in the dark in dark words and and hopefully matt gets some uh gets a lot of love for this uh I anthology so. and you know i we should note of course we're gonna get naysayers we're like oh this is like nepotism or favoritism <laughs> but motherfuckers this was a risk for us to do this okay we exactly. knew Rich wasn't going to be here. We could have just not done this episode at all. And I had presented this as kind of a joke that we cover Rich's story. <laughs> yes. And it wasn't until after we agreed to do this, I thought, oh, shit, what if we don't like it? I know. I was thinking about that, too. That's why I, I sent you that message yesterday, because because I and did that like worried the fuck out of me when I got there. You're like, <laughs> did you read Rich's story yet? And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Well, because I was trying to decide because, I mean, I brought up some of the issues that a little issues I had with it. And I was like, all right, well, do I do we just, you know, is Mike going to have the same issues? And then if so, are we going to just hound on that stuff? Or, you know, so I was like, should we read another story, too? So we have two <laughs> options because I was like, I would again, I mentioned that for all you listeners, like we're I we're trying like we are try we're being impartial. I brought up some of the issues I had with it. Yeah, and you know, it's it, that's always like the tough spot with this and especially with it being rich is like cuz we know most most of the stories we either cover we we interact with them a lot on Twitter or you know, they're some of the bigger stories, they're they're big names and so you're kind of like, well, do we want to just send all praise out or can we we you know, we should be impartial and be able to pick on it. And that's the same for this one, especially where I was like, man, if we, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like, Oh, this is the best story ever. Everyone needs to read it. Uh, but and I also don't want to, to harp on it because I know in a couple of weeks when Rich listens to it, I don't want him to be like, what the hell? 
Yeah. So if we end up announcing the end of staring into the abyss, <laughs> <laughs> if we have been unceremoniously canceled, you'll know why. <laughs> Rich listened to this and we were not effusive enough in our praising. <laughs> he's calling it quits. Right. He's like, we're done. Yeah. I'm through with you two nitwits and he'll be introducing new co-hosts. <laughs> and we'll start our own staring into the abyss, staring yeah. out of the abyss. Right. We'll be looking out, finding we'll be- <laughs> the light. We'll find the white space in the void. <laughs> we can be staring into the abyss too, staring harder. Right. <laughs> With more Sam Jackson gifts. <laughs> more Sam Jackson, some more Die Hard. It'll be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, needless to say, ultimately, I'm glad that we did like the story. And yeah. I think this was a really good debut for Rich. And it's a great anthology to be a part of, especially with a Brian Keene introduction, which is pretty fucking awesome. That in that introduction, Brian Keene name checks Richard Gerlock. Like, yeah, that's awesome. That's kind of a big deal. You know? that's, yeah, just a bit. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. And I say good for him. So I applaud Richard for this debut. And I want to know, Matt, where the fuck is yours? Well, uh, they, I have some out. So <laughs> are they I, out? I, I know you've gotten a sale. Yeah, fairly I sent ish. I wasn't sure. I, I haven't pimped, pimped any of those. I, currently have stuff um you it, really keep it on the down low you've got stuff out no one knows about it <laughs> so what is it <laughs> so if you if you search up there's a uh a magazine out of australia called thuggish thuggish itch i have that came out probably a year ago i have something in their uh carnival issue late last year i had uh in scare street i had a story in night terrors volume two which is crazy i looked and they're like up to 14 volumes now so i was like oh that one's pretty buried um but that <laughs> and it's under your name it's under matt brandenburg yes so okay i think if you if you search on amazon those will come up and then i have How uh keeping these secret you got like <laughs> a whole cv that you're unveiling right now what I happened i like it's always that tough part i so i have this thing this are you is, ashamed of these should we not <laughs> seek them out <laughs> no i i and i've talked to my doctors about this it's this life thing where <laughs> this I, is a medical issue <laughs> this <laughs> a mental medical issue where i can't i i i can't promote myself without going to the negative so yeah i like I don't wow. bring these things up because I just assume it's bad. Right. <laughs> it's a sensitive topic. I have. <laughs> no, this is, it's good. I thought I'm, it was going to be a bit. And no. I'm like, oh, fuck. this is like a whole. I'm being honest. Psychosis. Oh, this my God. A, like unplug. Is, yeah. I put no. Matt back into therapy with this question. <laughs> and, I'm sure I'm not the only one where if anyone congratulates me, I find five things wrong to say or like <laughs> to not play it. It's just me. But so, yeah, those ones are out. And then uh, later this year, um, through Pulse Publishing, I have a story in 99 Tiny Terrors, which I wish I had the table of contents. But there's some pretty um, sweet names in there. So that one's coming out later this year. And then I have one coming out. um, It's in a, a new company. And I'm drawing a blank. They've been kind of quiet, but it's called Sonorous Silence. Um, That's an anthology all about silence. And I'm in that. I know Laura Hightower is in there as well. Um, Yeah. So that's and I think Kelly Piper's in that one. Oh, my God. So I'm in that. That should be (laughs) <laughs> well, and it's funny with that one because I that accepted I got that back in September and so they've been kind of slow on getting it out. They're brand new publisher, so I'm just assuming that they're kind of getting trying to figure everything out. So well, that's remind con- for our readers when you say September, you mean 2020. Yes. <laughs> so 2020, so it's been a it's been a, a number of months. Um, Matt. <laughs> and then I have one coming out in Dark Corner Zine. Um, Match. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> so just a couple. <laughs> well, I just, if I ever need to share a secret really badly with somebody, I know who to go to now. Oh, yeah. Totally. I won't tell anybody. It's a vault. <laughs> I just 
Well, and for some of these ones that are coming out, it, it's that timing issue where I'm trying to I'm waiting to get like specific dates. So like I you know I'm like I could tell you all, but then after a while we'll forget. So I my God, I mean like, I know you've had acceptances. I had no idea <laughs> that you had stuff actually out and available. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just Holy yeah. The, crap. <laughs> I, the thuggish itch one uh, that one came out. Uh, yeah, like January, I think January, February of 2020. So that one, that one has, uh, yeah, that I one's been out. You're just sitting on all of this. <laughs> I know. It's again, it's that thing where I'm just like, oh, nobody cares. Like I'll tweet it out when it first comes out, and then I just let it sit. Cause I'm just wow. Like, <laughs> and I mean, you talk about writing pretty regularly, at least on <laughs> Twitter. Like I know you're always doing these workshops, you're going to seminars, you're learning the craft, and I know you're always submitting stuff. <laughs> yeah. I know you've gotten acceptances that <laughs> but um, I had no idea. I thought we were still waiting on your big debut and it's already been here. Nope, it's been out. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. <laughs> I, I it's I I play it very close to the chest apparently. <laughs> I guess so. Oh man. Yeah. So those are all, those are all out somewhere. I think, I think if you search my name on Amazon, definitely the scare street one will come out. I don't know if the thuggish itch one will come out. That one was funny because it is it's Australian. I was like, Whoa. <laughs> so, you know, it happens. You publish under Matt or Matthew? Matt. Yep. Scare street volume two. Yep. So yep, Matt Brandenburg, look at you, you, Oh, you don't have an author page set up, though. Oh, of course they don't. <laughs> you need to get on that. You need to go claim that. I know. I need to do that, and I need to get a website with my name. I had one at one point, and then it just I stopped doing it. But that way I have it all. Because, like, I also had something published, like, a couple years ago in C- uh, Siren's Call. And then I did something with Horror Tree, which is interesting. I've been <laughs> – this is, like, our funny times. So, like – Horror Tree does these tr- trembling with fear. So they're like, you know, 100 word drabble kind of things. Yeah. And, and they mentioned, I think they've collected them all and put them out all as collection or anthologies. I just never looked to see if mine made it into any of those. Wow. That. <laughs> that. I, I don't know what I was waiting for. I feel like I was just waiting to, I think this year I was like, well, I'll wait till these ones all come out and then I'll start being bigger at it. And then, yeah. I just it's it's a crippling thing that honestly happens. I'd never promote myself. <laughs> I guess so. Like, OK, so the one that I'm finding here is Night Terrors Volume 2, and it has almost 90 reviews right now. Yeah. And your story is one that reviewers are mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't even looked. I should look at those. But <laughs> Like you've got one here. It's a five star review who points out your story is one of the ones that they most enjoyed. Apparently, you've got another one that four stars again picks out your story <laughs> as one of the ones to look for. Like, <laughs> bash! <laughs> oh, you are killing me, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm like, oh, it could be better. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm all Every great. week we peel back that onion a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is this is a pretty deep onion, I, which <laughs> there's a lot of layers. Oh, yep. my God. You're buying your therapist a new boat. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's crazy. I know. I, 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 I. When Rich started mentioning this one, I kept thinking, I'm like, should I? I'm like, no, it's fine. I'll wait till I know when they're actually coming out. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, I'll do it next time. And then well, it just keeps you. So, yeah, they're all they're They're there. If people look. And I think this year we'll we'll see at least three more. So awesome. Well, we better fucking hear about them. Uh, when I know exact dates, I'll let everyone know the all the right. 99 Tiny Terrors. I did see that one is for sure coming out. I looked at the proof um, just this week and I want to see, cause I do want to there it again, this is not, this is that tough part because like, Hey, I should be promoting myself, but I'm more along the lines of promoting everybody else. There. <laughs> so I'm trying to find, because I just want to, I know there was some, like there's some 
pretty awesome names in there. Um, I and mean, I just, you said you're going to be in an anthill with Laurel and Haley Piper. Yeah, yeah. Like, these are not small potatoes, Matt. Oh, I know. <laughs> and there's a couple other. That one's been funny because, like, well, I'll, I made a mention on Twitter about being in it. And that's how I found out, like, Laura was going to be in there and Haley is going to be in there is because they were like, oh, cool. We're going to be TOC buddies. And and so, like, that one I don't know 100 percent on who all is going to be in there. <laughs> but, yeah, oh, you know. God, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a lesson to all you people. Don't be like me. My, my promote your stuff. You know, people will like that. <laughs> Apparently, and I've been sitting over here like a dumb fuck for two years, two three years now, wondering <laughs> when Matt's breakthrough is going to finally happen. <laughs> Who's going to finally I realize just, this and buy a story? Uh, and that know. Rich beat you to the punch. And <laughs> <laughs> I was letting him take his. You know, it's I was happy he got in a thing. Let him take, I was letting him get his thing, his due. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh man. Where is this? Cause I think it would be, it's just, well, I, I guess good on you for not rubbing it in his face. Right. Like he's like, oh, I got pulled the cell really well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> I've got my seventh anthology coming out next year, along with three more rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this 99 Tiny Tears, I just, because I think this will be a really cool, they wanted the story, although it's all flash, so it's everything a thousand words, I think, and so other people you should definitely check out for this one is, uh, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, and I know that she would probably hate that, but Seanan McGuire, she's in it, Meg Allison, Cat Rambo, uh, Lucy, yeah. Snyder, Lucy Snyder, uh, <laughs> you are in this. Yeah, Wendy Wagner, uh, <laughs> uh, Priya Saradha. I'm sorry, I pronounced your name wrong, <laughs> but you're in there. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to find some other names that I was like, oh, somehow I snuck in here. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, just like it just happened. Eric, Eric uh, Guignard, um, he's in there. Uh, Tim Wagner's in here. Uh, <laughs> so this, I, besides me, like you can ignore me being in here. There's a lot of big names in here. You no, should definitely no, 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 we're not ignoring that, Matt. You are in an anthology with huge, huge names <laughs> like <laughs> Tim Wagner, who just fucking won two Bram Stokers in one weekend. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just, yeah. So that's Shane and McGuire. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow he snuck in. <laughs> Matt. Matt, Matt, Matt. Yep. So I, I'll try to be better about telling people stuff when it comes out. <laughs> the things we learn on this show. <laughs> One of those 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 things for people. <laughs> it's funny because they're all going to be listening at first. They're going to be like, what the hell? Food Network. And then they're going to be like, oh, here they are just praising their person. And then they're going to be in here and they'll be like, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Fuck them. I am proud of you and I'm proud of Rich. You guys did great. You, you apparently have been doing great <laughs> and don't need my praise. Like. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, yeah, so for everybody listening, promote your stuff. Be proud of the work you did. Don't be like me. Yes. <laughs> Shout it from the rooftop. Let everyone know so we can go out and buy it and show our support and, uh, and read and, it. <laughs> and maybe just maybe if you're 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 getting stuff, people will notice that you're doing that stuff. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But, hey, you know what? I mean, obviously, your stories are doing the heavy lifting for that, right? You're obviously doing really good work. Well, thanks. To get placed into these anthologies and you do zero promotion. You don't tell anybody <laughs> about this. You don't mention it, but maybe one time in a fleeting tweet that <laughs> people are going to miss. <laughs> like, yeah, I could do it. Like, here you whole, are. <laughs> a whole course on that. You know, like. Oh, my God, Matt. This is sickening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll I'll get I'll I'll try to get better. I you know I'll give you the I'll give it. I, this is the course I could teach at places how not to uh, be this way. 
<laughs> so that'll be a high demand course. <laughs> <laughs> like, here are the things you should do. Here's the reasons why I didn't. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. <laughs> well, well, good on you, man. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, man. It's funny because people could probably, I'm like totally freaking out. <laughs> Chris, this is like, this is as bad as dolls for me right now. <laughs> well, we'll move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's good. I don't mind. I, you know, that part, that's cool. It's good. Well, we learned a lot today. We did. <laughs> One thing we did not learn is what we're going to be doing next week when Rich comes back. So yeah. <laughs> we'll find that out as we go. Your guess is as good as ours. It's going to be like a thousand word book. <laughs> yes, maybe. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, head on over to iTunes or any other podcatchers that you can rate and review Staring to the Abyss and let us know your thoughts. You can follow yeah. the show on Twitter at Into Staring. You can follow our host, who is absent today, Richard Gerlock at Rudy53088. Matt, yes. where can they follow you? <laughs> you don't need to know. <laughs> no. Where can they follow you and never get updates on anything that you have done? <laughs> I am on Twitter at Brandenburg DM. And also, this is totally stupid, and but I was really excited this week. Uh, and apparently, they've been doing it for a year. Google has brought back their podcast catcher thing i've been using stitcher and stitcher got terrible and now google podcast is back anyway that's it for me well that's great then you should be able to find into staring on itunes google play stitcher spotify and everywhere else you listen to podcasts (laughs) you can find me on twitter at mike h5856 or hit up my website at michaelpatrickhicks.com until next time Keep staring. Keep staring. Keep staring. Uh, staring into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> it's free time. You don't have to find an interdimensional saloon to have a pint of alien beer with me, Chrissy Garrison. Just tune into my alien beer podcast each Thursday, and I'll share my speculative fiction stories with you. And every other week, I'll be serving up a new installment in my science fiction serial, The Multiverse Blues. Meanwhile, catch up with me at sillyhatbooks.com slash podcast. See you there. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.